What up, HyperChange? Welcome to another episode. Uh, <laughs> Today we have an epic show lined up. Uh, I've got Mark Frommeyer and Ross Gerber on the program. Uh, two legendary guests. This is my first video since joining the bo board of Arkimoto. Um, I was going to talk to Mark and get an update from him about what the company's up to. And uh, he was also going to talk to Ross. So we figured why not combine this chat, um, two of my friends, and, and just talk all about Arkimoto, get an update straight from the company. Really excited to have you both on the program. Uh, welcome, Mark and Ross. Thank you. Here. What up, HyperChange? What up, Ross? Glad to meet you. Yeah, good to meet you too. I mean, this is kind of a a cool way to learn about a company because I'm still learning about Arkimoto and, and, you know, I've mostly learned through Gali and, and I'm really excited to learn more. Awesome. Well, where, where do I start? Uh, it was a, it was a snowy November in 2007. No. Yeah. I was going to say, tell, tell us why you started the company. I know this wasn't like your first career and, and you got into Arkimoto. What was your, what, what drove this passion? Well, I was, I was originally, uh, 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 well, once and still a video game developer ever since I was hey. a kid. And I uh, sold a company in 2007. Uh, and at that time, I, had, I, I went looking for a, a, a vehicle to drive. I was a bike commuter um, and uh, I wanted an electric vehicle. And I scoured the internet for months trying to find something that would be a good sort of everyday electric ride. I, 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 the options were like, you know, put down a reservation on a Tesla Roadster, uh, or get a get a golf cart, and I, you know, the Roadster would not have been a good fit for for my neighborhood or or uh, or lifestyle, and the golf cart just couldn't do what I would want for for a real daily transportation solution, and that that was what prompted me ultimately to start Arkimoto was the the sort of the perfect s storm of. Uh, First time at VAT as a startup uh, company, having a good exit, looking for a solution that didn't exist. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I actually, I saw a three-wheeled kit vehicle in a parade. And mm -hmm. that was just like that light bulb moment going, there is just, there's a giant gap between the bike and the car. And, and why are there not any really compelling products in that gap? And that started, a, what, what ended up being, I thought it was going to take six months to get to the right idea. It actually took seven years just to get to the right concept. Um, because, uh, you know, and, and it turns out that three wheel vehicle space, I mean, there've been many, many nice tries over the last hundred years, um, but getting it right, really hitting, hitting that right combination of capabilities and then doing that at the right, uh, at, at, a, at a level of weight and efficiency that would let it really be a true disruptor in the vehicle space that turned out to be a, a bit of a challenge. Yeah, I was I was going to say. So you you went from really being a software guy to to kind of building hardware, huh? That that is yeah. That, you know, I was I my my degree from from Cal is electrical engineering and computer science, and I thought you know it's electrical engineer in name only. I was definitely very focused on the CS. I was like, I'm a software guy. Never going to do a hardware project. I can you know sleep through EE40, um, and uh, you know be careful what you, how you limit yourself. Cause that was, uh, uh, and, and I think it, it's funny when you look at the EV space, you, you have a, examples of people making the jump from software to hardware. And I think, you know, ar arguably that's, that's an easier jump to make than to come from the traditional automotive world and make the jump into next generation. <laughs> that, well, that's what Elon thought too, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, if I'd had any idea how hard it was going to be, I mean, I probably never would have started. So it's it's a certain amount of ignorance uh, is is an enabler. I think that's kind of life, you know, like a lot of things we wouldn't have started if we knew how hard they were, right? Uh, um, so 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 take me through the timeline. So you started the company how long ago? Two thousand seven. And then you originally financed like friends, family, private equity. Yeah, uh, it was. I I did the you know. I did the first couple million in, um, you know, out of my ill-gotten gains, uh, and then when I when I blew through all my cash, then I you know friends and family, uh, I, I hit Sand Hill Road for the first time in 2009, uh, got laughed out of every single office. That's There's, how you know you're doing well. Right? They they had just uh, proceeded to you know before I got there they they'd already lit mountains of cash on fire with you know Fisker 1.0 and. Coda and Tesla and Aptera. I mean, it looked at that point like everything was going to go to zero. 
And I showed up with a, you know, wacky three wheeled vehicle concept from Oregon, having never made cars before. Um, and so, you know, then had to uh, make new friends and family stopped returning phone calls. Um, and eventually in 2015, uh, we, when we really got, I mean, and that was, I would say it was probably one of the best things ultimately that happened to Arkimoto is we never got venture funded before we figured out the right idea. Because I, there, with, with venture, there's always that push to go take what you've got and, you know, throw a bunch of cash at it and get it into the market. And um, that, that really doesn't work very well with vehicles. If you don't have product market fit really dialed and a really well thought through plan, there are just so many ways that you can bite the dust. And so when we felt like we really had it dialed that, you know, we took, a, uh, took really what was at that point still a napkin sketch um, and Bill Hambrecht through his third venture fund, uh, cut us our first real venture capital investment. And that was what paved the way for the IPO and then the right. push production, getting through compliance. Um, and you know, then we had our first year of production, first full year of, of production in 2020 uh, amidst you know, global pandemic, crazy. Yeah, I know, at least you picked a good year to start production. It, it, it was, you know, I think there were, there was, there, there were some silver linings. Yeah, I mean, the, the pandemic absolutely complicated everything, um, but it did give us, it gave us time to have a limited number of production vehicles on the road, um, get, it, get a lot of data back from our early customers and really think about what it's going to take to get to, to true meaningful scale and to not be doing that while we were, you know, fighting with uh, just, just again, to the, to the question of being in the market and the expectations of the market. Um, there, you know, the, the in the in the non-pandemic world, the focus is on you know what's your what's your quarterly unit volume, and is that on a regular escalating right, track? right? And the you post-pandemic know. is can you survive through uh, May? You know, uh, I think the pandemic helps you a lot because we've moved to a much more I would say localized delivery style culture now. Oh, where yeah. your vehicles actually make a lot more sense now post-pandemic than pre-pandemic in that, number one, I, I mean, from a delivery perspective, the smaller vehicles um, are super efficient, cheap to operate, cheap to buy. If I'm an Uber Eats driver, it seems like a no-brainer or whatever, and especially if so many communities are local. Um, and then all these people moving out of the big cities into communities now, and so many communities don't want cars driving around. So these vehicles are great, you know, just to cruise down to the local store or whatever. I don't need to take my car and all this kind of stuff. And so in a way, I think it helps you from the I get in my car and I drive two hours to work every day world to now I work from home and I order food in and the delivery guy might be your greatest customer. You know? Yeah, and to be clear, we thought we always thought our vehicles made sense in the pre-pandemic world. It's just the rest of the world didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, we think now, you know, things are getting, you know, that that's a good way to look at it. And I think you're still right. The rest of the world still doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> but you think about like what we're doing now. I mean, this is we're th to have this meeting in the in the you know traditional way of, oh, you got to have the face to face. And totally. I've got to what I got to go down to L.A. and Galileo's got to come down to have a discussion. This is this is, you know, we're doing national travel here in the most carbon efficient way you can. It, it's revolutionized my business, revolutionized. Yep. And we always wanted this, but the clients didn't, you know, and right. now it's perfectly acceptable to do business this way. Uh, super efficient, super good for the environment. Agree a hundred percent. So what's left for travel then is getting around my local community. That's what I'm saying. Short haul. And yep. And that's, that's really where, you know, I mean, in, in reality, that's where we, we drive, uh, even even cars. I mean, you drive uh, typical trips uh, nationwide pre-pandemic were 30 miles a day of driving or less, typically one or two people. Um, and I think that's going to that's gonna continue to tighten up. I agree. Yeah. I mean, I just bought a new Tesla Plaid because I had to. Congrats. I'm like, I don't even really drive anymore, you know? <laughs> like, I, like, I have this three in, in and in I think it's super efficient having an electric car because I don't drive very much and I own it. So I think this thing will last forever. You know, people don't talk about how long these things last because we don't know, but I think they're going to last like forever. 
And I mean, it's just wheels and stuff, right? And and so like electric vehicles, I think over time, people are going to realize the cost of operation is actually an advantage over time because oh, your cost of operation is so low. Um, and, and so once you buy an electric vehicle, you can keep it for a very long time. Well, we got to get um, you hooked up with a fun utility vehicle. Dude, right? I'm waiting. My kid's waiting. My kid is like, I show, see my kid, I don't know if he cares how much I, as an investor, but we invest in such great things like video games and, and, and electric vehicles. So when I showed him this thing, he was like, I can't wait, dad. And will they let me drive it? I go, you're eight. I don't know if they'll <laughs> let you drive it. You know, it's still an adult car, you know, but I let, I, I took him on an ATV the other day in Palm Springs and he was, it was really fun. You know, it's, so it's he, one of the cool things that you realize when when you think about and, and particularly when you're in an Arkimoto and you're at a stoplight surrounded by giant gas cars, you just think of what's this going to be like in, in five years in 10 years when everything around me is quiet and, you know, right. I get to actually experience the world. It, it's going it, to, you know, you're 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 in this car to kind of protect you from an environment that you're you don't want to be in, which is like the road. But when you when you're in an arc motor, you realize, wow, it's actually really awesome. To well, that's the motorcycle thing. See, yeah. I'll never drive a motorcycle because they're too dangerous, and I have kids. But I would totally drive this thing, and you get that same effect. I think that's the thing about the company you just bought too, right? It yep. makes it like the feel like way better driving these things. So I'm super excited to drive it. But I want to go back to to where you you ended with production. So you started production this year, and I. I I read you produced a handful of cars, not a ton of them. So, so we produced 47 in 2019, and then we produced, I think, 97 in 2020. Uh, and, and that's just, that was starts and stops due to COVID uh, supply chain. I mean, because COVID affected not just us, but every single one Everybody. of the uh, so, so you're based in Oregon is where the factory is? Yeah. Headquartered in Eugene, Oregon, the slightly lesser well-known automotive capital of the world. Um, Anyway, we don't we don't want to. That's actually, what they said about Fremont. You know what I mean? Totally. Uh, and and the 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 goal now is we we just uh, we're we're on the cusp of really getting that river flowing, where the 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 parts are all showing up at the right time, and uh, the the assembly line is is moving forward. And then that's we're just going to over the course of this year, the plan is to just ratchet up at a relatively slow level. Uh, and then we are in. We you know we just uh, agreed to purchase a new factory space that's about five x the size. Right, I just saw that. Right, and that's going to provide the space to to really hit scale, uh, at least at our level. You know, we're we're we see mass production um, at the, kind of the 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 cusp of mass production is being in that uh, fifty thousand units per year realm. And right, we're in the planning phase of that to be there. You know, in the couple year out time frame. So, so, the, so really the short-term goal is to get to annual run rate of about 50,000 vehicles. Um, right now you're in like sort of pre-ramp, like you're, you're moving up every month, your production levels. Um, you're, now are you, is it a second factory or are you gonna move into a new factory? It's, it's only about, it's, it's a long block away from our present facility. So we're gonna keep the facilities that we right. have. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, once really the idea here is one, uh, def, you know, prove out and, and refine for the mass production version of the vehicle, because there, there are going to be things that we change about how we build it when we're building at higher volume and then design the factory that builds at that rate. And the, the goal there is to really just have, I mean, you can kind of think about it like cores on a microchip, right? You, if you've got a, if you've got an eight core chip, uh, then you can perform eight of uh, eight computations at the same time. If you've got a 16 core chip, you can do 16 things at the same time. What we're building right now, what we're defining is the 25,000 unit core of Arkimoto manufacture. And then once we've really got that dialed, we just want to take that and copy, paste, 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 not here. We want to do it, you know, uh, the next, the next factory would be on the East coast somewhere. Uh, and then ultimately, we see this platform as being uh, really ideal for a lot of different markets around the world where we would want to build. Well, I think it would do amazing in Asia. I mean, everything's small and same with Europe, for that matter. Everything's small, um, you know, so it's like 
parking spaces. There's no garage. I mean, there's no garages in Tokyo, you know, or whatever, you know, so it's like small vehicles. I mean, I think Tesla's working on that too. Like we need to make like a smaller vehicle. And so from your size, it fits kind of anywhere, you know? Yeah. And that's, that's where, if you look at what's happened in a lot of emerging market countries, as they move to the automobile, you take cultures that are very bicycle, motorcycle right. centric, and you add in the American idea of the car, and it just absolutely crushes. I mean, tra traffic becomes a, a huge problem. Congestion. Well, that's the, that is the problem in India and China, and you know. So we see this as right. You know, for, for any of those types of markets, this is kind of an off ramp from the automotive idea. Uh, to something that still still gives you a really great ride. I mean, it has, the, the U.S. Ha, ha, is a very demanding market in terms of the quality of ride, ha, the, the experience of the ride. And I think that's one of the reasons- well, It's just that about Harley-Davidson in, in our history. You know, I used to own stock in Harley back in the day. Uh, I loved the company back then. Um, and, and people want a great ride, you know? Yeah, so that, that's that been really core to, to the Arkimoto experience is delivering a truly compelling ride experience. So is your main customer a, a, a person or is it really a segmented business where you're looking from a, a fleet perspective, a consumer perspective, a government perspective? You know, what's, where do you really see your sales? Like what's the, the goal from a sales perspective? So, so today it's, it's very largely consumer. Right. Yeah, it's people who've been waiting around a long time to get, get their Arkimoto's. Uh, but we introduced the, the Deliberator, which is our last mile delivery version right. uh, last year. And that's, you know, that, that is somewhat individual focus. So, so somebody who's doing a ton of gig economy driving um, and paying for gas and having trouble parking, they can buy a Deliberator and it does a much better job for their, for their job. Um, but ultimately, you know, over the, over the long haul, we think that these are going to be awesome rideshare vehicles, awesome right. Vehicle share vehicles uh, that when when in the in the autonomous world we think this makes sense for because if you look at I mean ride shares eighty to eighty five percent single passenger right in Priuses Lyft taxis so in that world we think eighty to eighty five percent of the vehicles on the road should be on a platform like this and that's that's what we've really been optimizing for. Uh, and then you look at what uh, you know what the Biden administration has said that where they're going to yeah, I bet you're happy about the election, huh? Transform. I, you know, I, I think uh, having a having a fully uh, aligned Congress and uh, and White House that takes uh, climate change seriously is it's it's absolutely critical for uh, you know for for the world the world and for the for human survival. So uh, yeah, I would say that we we ended up with with a very necessary. Uh, election outcome in, in that regard. Well, you know, that's why, I mean, we've been in, interested in this space just because we know that that's the future. But like when you have an administration that cares about oil and coal, like and money, basically, it's it was like super counterproductive from where we left off with Obama. So yeah. I'm, I'm really excited. I mean, that was kind of the core of our bets in as far as investment thinking was, I didn't think we were going to win all three houses, but I thought we were going to win the White House. But this has worked out even better than we could have imagined uh, for clean energy initiatives. So, so I think that's another real bullish thing for your company moving forward. Well, and just uh, having a having a cohesive response, even just to the pandemic, uh, is I know going to be pretty important for getting things, you know, getting business back to business. Yeah. Yeah. And it's almost like not even a, a new policy or like the U.S. making some bold, ambitious policy. It's almost catching up to all of these other countries who've already yeah. banned ICE vehicles in 2030. Uh, like this, the world had already moved ahead. And so now just us getting to that kind of status quo feels like a huge thing. And one thing you said about India, I always think about the Indian market where cars really struggle, but these micro EV, EV right. vehicles flourish because the population density is so high. Is that, are we looking at the past when we look at India or is that a preview of the future of urbanization? I almost think it's more of a preview of the future Future. And yes, the, the, my question to you, Ross, and this is like the first kind of thing about think about Arkimoto is, what do you think it looks like? Because you're kind of a cool LA guy. The first time I saw Arkimoto, I was like, what is this thing? Like, this I'll is so I, wonky. And really then wait, wait, in person in New York no. City, this thing is like turning heads more than a Tesla. Everyone from little kids to grandpas, 
like to dudes in suits are like, oh my God, what is that thing? Can I like, they're asking the stats, like the IRL wow factor is huge. So I'm just curious, like what, what did you think when you saw it, Ross? So, so a show I used to like was Eastbound and Down and he used to ride this like three wheel motorcycle. And I used to think it was hysterical. Um, and, 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 and so I have this theory about cool. Cool is relative to the person, you know? Like I know, like I'm friends with this guy and he's just, he's in the music industry and he's just cool. You know, it's just like everything he wears looks good. I could literally wear the same exact outfit and people would laugh me out of the room. You know what I mean? So like, like you, like, like Galley can do certain things because he's Galley and it just works, but it wouldn't work for somebody else, you know? Um, so I think that's the challenge you have in marketing or positioning your product is by working with the right influencers, the right musicians, the right people that can position the product as cool, then the perception will be that. Do I think an EV three-wheeler car is a super fun, cool thing? Absolutely, absolutely. But a lot of that depends on like, I look at different styles and colors that you guys have. And some of them I would go, I would never do this ever. And some of them like, this looks super fun and cool. Like I can't wait to take this thing out. So I think it just depends on the style and the color and, and, and the, the sort of flashy stuff you might put on there. In, in its core, it can be a super cool vehicle, for sure. But I think cool is something that is a marketing thing. And so you get the right people involved, you know, like getting Galley involved. Yeah, he's a smart kid or whatever, but he's also super in with the right crowd of young adopters of technology. And so you know, you know, that's what, you know, I can do too, you know, where, where we say what's cool and it's cool, you know? And so I think like some things are just uncool and it doesn't matter what you do, you know, but like, you know, the Tesla Model S was a sedan. It was a four-door sedan. It's not the flashiest car you've ever seen, but it became cool because Kanye got one, you know? And, and, and that, that helps when you have, you know, like Kanye driving around your car and stuff like that. So that's a different part of Arkhamokoto's strategy that we can talk about some other time as far as positioning the product in the marketplace. And that's crucial to success, especially through influencers and the right people, whether it be in music or, or sports or whatever. So I don't think you'll have problems with that because I think fundamentally the product is a fun product. And so it's cool. You know, fun things are cool. But, I, you know, you get, you know, like a young hip you know race car driver kind of guy driving dude if this is in a music video like a hip-hop music right. video is what i keep saying like travis scott he did the uh the cyber truck with the cyber quad like right. you get someone like that like skirting with the arkimoto it's game over you well know? that's my other company my, i have a music product video production company where we use musicians to to market products and and you know this works really well um but that's a different thing what I really want to know, and I think what's really important is the financial side of the business, where I, I know you've, you've raised money, a fairly decent amount of money. It doesn't look like the company needs money. You've been investing your money wisely. You know, how, how do you see the finances of the company over the 2021, 20, 22, as you ramp production? What are your capital needs? Um, are you coming back to market? Um, where do you see sales over the next couple of years? I, before Mark answers this, I want to jump in with one thing, uh, just before we look forward to look back, like when I was analyzing Arkimoto before I joined the board, I had never seen an EV company be so efficient with its capital other than Tesla. Like Mark can correct me if I'm wrong, but it took about 40 to 50 million of dollars to develop and build this factory and get it to live production. Like you look at any other EV startup, they're just bleeding money, spending yeah, it like crazy. That's his, it's so, his own money. He exactly. Put money into it. All these other EV companies are a guy with a piece of paper selling some bull crap to somebody to outsource everything. You know what I mean? And, and it's a big difference when you put your own money into things and you build your own company. I, I definitely found that we had, uh, you know, I think there were a couple of reasons why we had real discipline around cash. And one is that, that I did put in uh, you know, the, the first real sizable chunk of money to get it going. And I've, I've made significant investments in it over time. And so I, I look at every dollar that comes in from an investor in the same way, right? It's, you know, I, we try and be, make sure that, and, and I, it's something else. I mean, it's something we learned, we bootstrapped our game company, uh, Garage Games. And it was like, let's make sure that, that every dollar goes on the screen. 
right? That we're not that we're not wasting, uh, you know, that that we're really moving the needle forward with the money that we spend. And so I've, the other reason is that as an as an Oregon vehicle startup company, I mean, this is not we aren't located in Palo Alto slash Fremont. We are, uh, you know, the so the the sources of capital have been, uh, you know, sort of few and far between, particularly in the early years. And that I think just by necessity we had to be incredibly efficient with cash, and that has that has stayed as as really a core philosophy of the company. Um, we're, we're efficiency is is our is our mandate in the vehicles we build and the energy we use, uh, and and capital is a piece of that. Um, and it I would say that 2020 was a was definitely a watershed year in terms of the capitalization of the company because we have, I mean for I was thinking back in and over the 13 years of the company's existence, a, in a, a super majority of those months, uh, we had, I, I would imagine, I think less than three months of runway right. in the bank. So we, we lived through you know, a decade plus, just right on the edge, uh, where, where we had to make really meaningful progress with every dollar that we had. Uh, 2020 allowed us to, to finally flip the equation. Uh, we did, Five financings that netted 56 million, um, and that put us in a in a very good position to execute going forward in 2021 and 2022. Uh, we we do think that getting to mass production. I mean, if you think about building at a rate of 50,000 units a year, if we are able to sell at an average selling price of 15,000, that's significant revenue. Uh, yeah. and to get there, it will require some more substantial investment. Right. We are looking for, for the for the bulk of that scale financing. We are looking to the advanced technology vehicle manufacturing loan program through the Department of Energy, which mm -hmm. is the, if you think back on on the history of Tesla, right. uh, they, they went public to to you know sort of get booted up on the factory, and then they uh, they they got the ATBM uh, in order to scale. And so we think that there's you know there there. There are some very clear, bright examples of companies that, when when the federal government has uh, put skin in the game, that, that it's worked out incredibly well uh, for for all the stakeholders. Um, and so we're we're going to absolutely make that same argument to uh, to the Biden administration regarding our Komodo uh, and our path to scale. Um, we are also though in a, in a different position uh, than we were in the market, uh, you know, certainly a year ago. And so, uh, if uh, I think we will continue to be opportunistic um, uh, about raising cash, uh, both from the public markets and from the federal government, I would say though that, and, and I think this does come down to the difference between, um, you know, being a, a founder CEO with a ton of skin in the game and a, a more of a hired gun CEO is that I am hyper conscious of, of shareholder equity and of dilution. Um, and and so I I think I've uh, tried to be very careful about making sure that we grow the pie faster than we uh, than we shrink the slices. Right, right. Well, you know it's it's amazing you said that because that's an incredibly important point. Uh, being a CEO, you know, founder myself, I 100% agree with that thinking because. You know, people are like, why don't you raise money? Why don't you do this? Because I'm like, I don't want to dilute. Like, we're killing it. We don't need money. You know, it's like you own this. It's your company. So it's like you're not as quick to just like print money and, you know, like pay yourself kind of thing. Um, and I think that's a, a great thing for investors to know, like that the CEO has his skin in the game and he's thinking like an owner, you know, and, 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 and it sounds like it should be like this everywhere, but it's just not. Well, and, and you also think about, you know, one of the arguments that, that Galileo has made is that companies should start uh, putting some of their balance sheet into uh, into cryptocurrencies. And he's a kid. Uh, you know, be, because you've, you've got uh, uh, governments, you know, running the printing presses on fiat currency. And I, I would say that, you know, to me, I, I look at that, that you know, the, the buffer of, of, of cash that we need right. for achieving next objectives, but that you know there is a there is a definitely a finite number of you know dollar sign fuv that that i'm in control of that the board is in control of and so we don't want to turn that spigot on when you know the the cash spigot is 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 sort of blasting cash into the market 
Well, so, I think this this push for companies to put their cash into Bitcoin is a little bit not fully understanding the way companies operate. You know, like a lot of companies, including mine, we we have a lot of money that we just need to have as a cushion, and it's it's not meant to be fluctuating. You know, um, and it's irrelevant. But then we have, and like my company, we do have an investment account, and I'm fine putting that money in Bitcoin. It's in stocks and bonds. You know. Um, but that's excess capital. Most companies, the capital they have is an excess. So I think it makes sense for Apple maybe to buy some Bitcoin, but certainly, you know, maybe even Tesla now that they have 19 billion. But, you know, for most companies, it's about what, where's my capital going to be spent and, and what's my return going to be for doing this? And so having volatility in your corporate finances doesn't serve your shareholders, you know? Totally agree. Yeah, no, we, we're not, you know, currency speculation it, is not part right. of it. And like Akramoto needs the money right now to build their, their products, you know, and like in the short term. So like, I think from a treasury investment perspective, it makes a lot of sense to invest extra money, but for startups, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I think I think at the point, I mean, we're certainly a conversation we could revisit when we are uh, cash flow positive and, and you know, pretty Yeah, like when you're calling me up saying, hey, we got money to put aside, what should we do with it? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a great stage to be in, you know? Yep. But right now you're you're the capital, you know, eater. You need the capital now. And that's going to be the key to your success actually is having, you know, good liquid capital to build the business as rapidly as possible because I think the demand for the product is going to be there. Yep. I agree. So, so, so then that, that leads me down the road. So this is kind of an exciting time for the company because really over the next... I would say 24 months, you're looking to get to full production. Is that really what we're looking at? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, we, we've, we've definitely, I would say there, there are kind of two pieces of that. You know, one is, one is definitely getting, getting to a point, you know, the mission of the company is to help catalyze the shift to a sustainable transportation system. Totally. That's we, why don't, here. we don't do that unless we build a lot of vehicles. Right. So, so that's, uh, that, you know, getting to that point where we truly have the archetype of the product that can is, is at scale and have really well defined the system that builds it. Um, that's the point at which we can, you know, copy paste those cores all over the place and really begin to make a, a big difference in terms of the, of the mission. And yeah, then, I mean, I think that's the Tesla business model too, where it was like, until we really get this down in Fremont, but really Fremont's about a prototype. Yeah. And then we could put that and now they're doing it. It's super cool to see, you know, it's like, wow, yeah, they, you know, they really did Tesla, do it. Yeah, Tesla. yeah. They're like, how do they build Giga Tesla. Berlin so fast? And I'm like, well, they've already done it three times, you know, yeah. so they know everything they order and they just, you know, the machine builds the machine. Um, and I think so. So going back, uh, is your model similar to Tesla that you're going to do direct sales? Oh, yeah. 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 We, we sell direct uh, vehicle shows up in your driveway after you right. order online. The difference, I think unlike Tesla, you probably don't need as much service, right? Because it's a smaller, easier vehicle, right? It's, it's a yeah, it's a it's a smaller, easier platform to service. You can service it inside of a truck because it's smaller than you know. It's it's a much smaller vehicle. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and then the other piece of it is that because you can ship six of them inside of a box truck, uh, we can use just normal common carriers, right, uh, to to get them out into the marketplace, and that I think is going to be a, a major. Uh, roadblock remover, you know, we, we don't have the same delivery hell challenge oh. because we can use standard trucking fleets to move the vehicles around. It's a nightmare at Tesla. The way Tesla works is a nightmare. It's like, seriously, I, I, no, I mean, like Elon, Elon is a genius in getting things to work. You know what I mean? Like that, oh, yeah. that nearly could have been better done, you know, and then he'll like fix it and make it even better but he always does things the hard way. He just does, you know? Um, and I don't recommend that for businesses, you know? And, and then and then that forces him to solve the problem. And he's smart enough to get himself out of the problems he causes. Um, but boy, is it a hard way to do things. Um, so, so knowing that, um, yeah, I like the idea of de delivering direct and having a simpler system for service and sales. Um, and then that goes back into Elon said he's open to uh, outsourcing, I mean, to licensing autopilot. Obviously, you're not building an autonomous platform. 
So I assume that's part of the, the, the pie. You have a, an app on your phone. Uh, essentially, maybe we get autonomous software on this kind of thing. Yeah, we, we're, you know, so, so again, we've been, we've been capitalized to solve a very narrow set of the problem. And, and, and that's really, I, I like solving problems that other people aren't presently working on. You know, so, so the problem that we saw was the, the sort of right size platform for everyday trips. Um, but we're definitely building it with an eye to autonomy. We're not going to uh, at least presently have no plans to do the sensor and software stack, but right. we're building the basic platform to be able to accept steering commands and driving commands and braking commands um, so that you know anybody's self-driving software stack uh, can sit on top of it. And that's really where we see ourselves fitting into that ecosystem is being you know, the, the basic vehicle platform. And I think there's there's so much cool stuff that right. Tesla is doing that would be very complimentary. Right. Uh, the, the, the battery cells that they've that they've been developing are just awesome. Um, autopilot, uh, the, the charging network that they've built out. I, you know, I, I think there are a lot of ways that we could be very- I don't think they're selling those cells though. I don't think they're gonna give those away. Sweet, sweet cells. Come on, come on, Elon. I don't think so. I think Elon's keeping all those. He's going to give you those LG chems. Um, and that goes to my, 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 my biggest question. And I talk about this now on every interview because I learned this from Elon and I believe this 100%. The biggest challenge for EV production in the future is a lack of supply of cells. The biggest challenge is going to be every company wanting to build EVs and needing battery packs. So how do you solve that problem moving forward? Well, well I, think, I think one of the, there are probably two pieces of that. You know, one is that, that uh, the fact that Tesla is taking this on as you know, sort of a, uh, a moonshot challenge that, that it looks like they're gonna get into mass production in 2021, that is going to have a, a ripple effect throughout the rest of the industry, right? So, so if, you know, and, and I guess the argument to, uh, you know, to Tesla, to, to anybody is, that when you when you put your cells inside of an Arkimoto, you are solving four times the number of daily trips. Where, you know wh that same amount of cells can power four Arkimotos that power. Right, Tesla. right. And so if if the shared mission is catalyzing the shift to sustainable transportation, if you want to make that equation that reaction go faster, then putting putting those cells into lighter weight, ultra efficient vehicles. Is is totally on on plan. Uh, Who are you sourcing from now? Uh, we we source presently from uh, a company called Ferrisys. Uh, mm -hmm. They're a, it's a Bay Area battery company with gigafactories now in China. They've uh, broken ground in Europe and they've got one uh, planned for the United States. Um, they make a super awesome pouch cell mm -hmm. uh, that uh, that it's the same one that's in the Zero motorcycle. Um, so and and. You know, I think what, what Tesla's work is going to do is inspire everyone um, to move faster on that front. I agree. Well, especially uh, in battery. I mean, we're putting a lot of money there now. The capital's going there because we know that that's the biggest part of the chain that needs to be filled. I also think there's going to be a lot of churn in, my guess is that there's going to be a lot of churn in the market as automakers, some do and some don't hit their targets on sales. Totally and, agree. And so you've got all the you've got battery companies that are ramping up scale of production. Ultimately, to actually get those to the market, they got to go inside something. And so what we're focused on is making sure that we have a very robust platform that requires as little energy as possible to solve daily trips, and then make sure that we've got the sales pipeline that brings that into the marketplace. Well, I think it also argues for your timeline too, because I think getting into production now and ramping now you're years ahead of some of these competitors. And yeah. so you're going to be a priority. Like every day counts right now in the EV race, you know? And so like, I think a lot of these competitors are still two years behind. So, you know, that gives you an advantage. And, and I look at a lot of the companies going after electric cars and I just, I, to me, it feels like they're going to run face first into Tesla. Um, we're, I, we're I agree hundred percent, but I, I still think the demand is there. So if you go to a Ford dealership and there's a, an electric Ford and the regular Ford. I think people want those electric cars and yeah. especially once they drive them, you know, and that's kind of to Arkimoto's, you know, credit. I mean, I'm sure these things handle like super fun and, you know, 
How long does it take to charge one on a regular plug? I, uh, you know, if you if you fully drain the battery, it's an overnight charge. Right. But, you know, typically you're only driving 10 or 15 miles, and that's you know a couple hours tops on a 110. But I think mine does like five miles an hour when I plug it into a 110 or whatever. My Tesla. Yeah. Yeah, you'd, you'd be looking at probably more like eight to 10, something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's what I think, yeah. Or, or well, I, actually a Model 3, I mean, we're we're, we're about 20% more efficient per mile than right. a, model, a Model 3 is. Uh, and, and that's a gap that we expect, you know, will grow over time as we optimize power electronics and aerodynamics. And so is, the battery packs are about a quarter of the size of a Model 3. So yeah, it's, it's basically- It's a 19 kilowatt hour pack. Okay, so it's 19 kilowatt. I was really Great. surprised when I drove mine because uh, it has like a hundred miles of range. Like it really held up to that. It wasn't even that warm in Eugene. And I drove around Eugene for like three days and it was really held true to that hundred mile range. And then you plug it in, like you don't need the special, you know, 220 volt or do any of that electricity, literally like the normal plug you plug your iPhone into is right. the one we're talking about that can give you the full range. So um, in that way, it's almost like more convenient because it's not, like you said, it's a fourth the size of the battery you pack. You have a fast charging system on it or it's just regular plug or? It's you no, know, it, it's a, it's a J plug, you know, the J1772 level two. We don't have a DC fast charge uh, option today. Uh, I think for, you know, and that it's, it's really sort of to, uh, you know, we're going after the low hanging fruit at the beginning. Uh, as, as we expand into, you know, colder weather markets into, uh, fleet sales. you know, fleets where you're going to want to turn via, you know, you're going to want to be turning 200 miles a day on the vehicle. Uh, then, then that option is going to be really, well, it goes a hundred miles on a charge. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good, that's more than enough for a day, you know, and your, your average delivery driver is doing something like 75 to hundred miles a day. Your average, uh, consumer is doing 30 miles a day. Right. Right. So, so we get half of, you know, at least half of those markets. Uh, so essentially you're just saying like, it's a plug and play thing. Like you buy it on your, on the app or the website, you ship it to the house and a regular shipping thing. I get this thing, I unpack it or, or whatever, and I can just plug it in to whatever and start playing. That's the vision. Yeah, that's great. I like it. And then, you know, I think a lot of people are going to want to try it out before they buy it. Obviously, it's a pretty big ticket item. And so that's where we're really looking to uh, to vehicle rental in destination markets. Right. The, the, the primary try before you buy. Or you can uh, sell a ton of these in Palm Springs, man. A ton yeah. of these. Yeah. We think any, you know, Southern California, Florida, Texas. What about a golf cart? What about making one of these like a golf cart? Well, we we are uh, we've we've got the golf club attachments already. Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying, man. Golf needs something to make it a lot more exciting. These things would be a lot more exciting than a golf cart. You know what I mean? We're gonna have a you know, just drive one. You know, we're, we're gonna have a, a a golf course mode that you can select. Right. But it won't. Uh, and now you got Florida sales going through the roof. You know, like the people will drive these little vehicles in Florida around. You know, like golf carts and stuff and. Boy, you roll in, you know, to Trump Doral in your EV, right? <laughs> the Mar-a-Lago special. The Mar-a-Lago with your 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 fub, and uh, you'd be like, Trump, can you take my my EV? I, I gotta go eat some lunch. You know, he'll be valeting soon. No, totally. Yeah. No. I, I, you gotta pay the bills, man. Well, you got the uh, you got like the villages in Florida. It's six. It has, yeah. 60,000 registered golf carts on the road. I know. God, That's what city. I'm saying. One city. I'm so. in Southern California and there's like, you know, communities that don't want cars driving around at all anymore. Yeah. And they all have golf carts. And, you know, it's almost like a competition to see who has the coolest cart. And I'm going to win when I get this thing. This is the coolest one for sure. Oh, yeah. And it's fast, right? I mean, it's like a real thing. Yeah. So you can also take it on to full speed roads. Yeah. I mean, so... So you can run it down to the market. It's not just like, see, that's the problem with the golf carts. You know, you really can only use it to screw around. There's not much utility to it. And now I can buy one of these and drive my kids to the beach, but I could also go and pick up food on a regular road. You yeah. Know? yeah it's, it's, you think about the, the, the golf cart is that neighborhood electric vehicle and you're really, you're kind of landlocked to your neighborhood island. Um, but I, I look at the Arkhamoto more as just a, more as like a community electric vehicle. You like can you, sell these in Santa Monica by the million, you know, like the city of Santa Monica just wants to buy electric vehicles and yep. they use all these weird, small kind of things. 
And and I, I mean, I think that could be a great business for you guys just dealing with the public sector. You, you know. got you got some cool stuff in Santa Monica coming soon. Yeah, yeah, they're very green there. That's really cool thing about the city, um, despite the police and all the problems. Um, so, so now, so, so, so really from a product perspective, the idea is we've got a, like a platform and then we can adapt it to various markets depending on where demand is. And then we're really building factories to grow regionally and natural nationally. And you essentially have a pretty easy product to put together, it seems. Am I right about that? Well, it's, it's uh, I mean, it is still a, it is still it's a, a car, but I'm just but, saying like compared, is it harder to build a motorcycle, like a gas motorcycle? Oh yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a bunch, there are many fewer parts in the drivetrain, for example. Right. That's what I'm trying to say. The car. Yeah. And, and the other Part of that is that it's it's just it's smaller than a car it's it's smaller than a car and simpler than a motorcycle, right. so than a typical gas motorcycle. So you have something that is it it just it it takes up a lot less space to produce, uh, and you can get everything from shipping it to repairing it to yeah. uh, you know putting it together in the first place. It's it's a I, I guess when you say when you ask if it's easy, it's like well. Build, building it is not it's not non-trivial to assemble a motor vehicle no matter what it is no i know i know but i mean i i can't i can't build anything but i'm just saying in the sense of like i i've I, i'm coming from being heavily scarred through the the tesla experience so yeah. when you know like elon built the model x he was like oh we built these cool doors shouldn't be a problem you know it was like the worst idea i've ever seen you know and then model three came out i was like oh He's probably learned his lesson. No, you know, um, and so it's like, that's what I worry about. So when I look at a product like yours, it makes me happy because you're not overcomplicating something, well, you know, not that building one is easy, but it's certainly you're not trying to make it hard. See, I think Elon likes hard things. It's, it's I, I, yeah, Challenges. I, I would say it's, you know, and, and I think it has been, while it is certainly a challenge uh, to you know to get anything to scale, I think we have right. a, probably an easier lift uh, than 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 Tesla did for sure. Uh, the other the other part of that is it it's it is one platform that is shared between all of the products in the family. So and and really takes that idea of platform kind of to the extreme, where you have an you know the typical automotive platform for a, a, a GM or a Ford might be. 30% of the parts are shared and 70% are unique to each model in the line. Uh, Tesla with the Model 3, Model Y, sounds like they got it up to like 80%. Right. Uh, with Arkimoto, they're, they're, for all practical purposes, kind of the same product. It's right. like 95% right. the same thing going after lots of different slices of the overall market. And so getting, getting that platform to scale and then I, I think as what we've learned a lot in this in this last year is as we vary those you know sort of the hat that goes on it, uh, we want to make sure that in the next rev that that's really that all of those interfaces are really well understood uh, so that it's it's easy to modify for different purposes. Right, and that's where I think you can make a lot of money is by building the business that way. So you're not building one thing for one person and another thing for another person and then that person cancels and that line has to be completely redone you know it's like a nightmare uh, see i like really focused companies i like you know like this is what we do we're going to be really good at this you know versus we're going to do one of these we're going to do one of those and then we're going to try one of those too and i'm like well which one's going to really work and we're like oh i don't know you know um so i i like that about your business a lot i i really do because i think Focus is going to be key. I think scale is the hardest part, you know, like getting to 50,000 cars is the hard part. The product's kind of the easy part, but then the, the, the manufacturing, I think, is the hard part. And then then you get into customer service. Um, what's your plan with that? You know, I'm a big believer that there should be humans involved with customer service. Oh, yeah. Uh, not just like Zen bots and things like that. Um how are you building out the experience? I think this is a really important thing to think about and something that Tesla has done very, very well um, and Apple 
and all great companies is they make the experience with your company um, pleasant and unique. Um, yeah, and I think we've, we've really tried to do, and I, I don't think that we tried to do this on purpose, but it's just the Arkimoto team is, a, it's a team of humans, right? That are, that are uh, you know, that, that are bound together trying to solve uh, what is for most of us, the most significant challenge in our lives. Um, and I think that that carries over to our customers is really getting that sense of uh, that, that we are all on the same team ultimately. Um, and there, there uh, I've, I've had a little bit of the a back and forth with our, with our own internal marketing team about just making sure that there is a human interaction in the sales process. Right. That's what I'm talking about. I want it to flow uh, very simply throughout the web, but having just having somebody pick up a phone and give you a call and say, Hey, I saw your order come in. I want you to know uh, we're here to help you through the process. Um, that there is somebody else on the other end of the line. That's huge to me. That's huge to me because then, that, that bolsters the relationship with the customer. Yeah. And then when it comes to, when it comes to service, you know, we, we really think about this, like the, you know, sort of the, the Volkswagen bug model is that you have something that is, if you, if you ever had one of those back in the day, you, know, you, could, you could get the manual and anybody with just a, a normal set of tools could change out the, you know, change out the air filters and, uh, you know, modify the engine and, and all that kind of stuff. So we, we building a product that is very easy to service and that doesn't require a lot of service is, is the foundation of, the you know the in-market service experience totally and then on top of that we want to make sure that we have in every market that we go into that we have have built out a local team um and and primarily this is going to be made up of you know we we don't uh envision uh, uh service and parts as being a profit center for the company of any significance so, yeah i call it the opposite the auto industry model yeah totally I love your happy car that needs lots of service so we can make money on service. I, say, I like you have you have several opposite the uh, models. As, well, as, you know, it's like a lot of great new businesses are the ones that are just opposite the way it used to be. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that's where that's business that we actually want to give to uh, folks who are already in market doing light automotive service. Totally. So, you know, totally. We, them, we make sure that they're trained up. We have our we have a. We already have a very great, uh, very good set of, of training tools for uh, for the Arkimoto vehicles in terms of service, um, and then just make sure that we're onboarding sufficient service in every market so that we don't have long lags uh, of, of service on vehicles. Yeah, I mean you got to contract that out as soon as possible. It's kind of there's all these shops, you know. And I think once you get the preferred Arkimoto shops, then that's then you're set. Yeah, and you just look around any town and. America, you've got, uh, you think about how much of the real estate footprint of every city is dedicated to uh, servicing or fueling or selling or buying cars. You should see LA, right? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, there's streets that are just dealerships that are looking like they're going to be empty pretty soon. So, so, you know, we, we, we only reinvent the wheel when absolutely necessary. Um, That's something that, you know, and again, I think that analogy for a three wheel car company. We, we don't reinvent the wheel. We just use fewer of them. We use less. We don't yes. reinvent them. We just use less of them. Um, you know, when I said that about the car industry, you know, I think about that way the car industry works today. And I, I, I actually think every bit of it makes no sense to me, you know, from the way they sell their cars to service to dealerships. It's, it's such a screwed up system where all the incentives are for the wrong things, you know? And so it's like, you know, you, you have a warranty that, you know, only works for three years and then your car falls apart because everybody's got to make money on service and, you know, and, you know, it's crazy. But the, the, the auto body shops in LA make a fortune. The auto shops, the, the mechanics, they make a fortune actually because of all the problems ICE cars have inherent. And that's part of the way they're built. So I think the EV market, that's another argument why EVs are such great investments for people is that they're not set up to die in three years. You know, if, if I have no incentive to make money on service, right? If it's a negative incentive, then I build a better vehicle. That's the way I look at it. And I think for, particularly for this end of the marketplace, uh, 
you know, what it, I'm reminded of a quote, I think it's Theodore Levitt who said, you know, people don't want a quarter inch drill, they want a quarter inch hole. And yeah. So, you know, figuring out how to, how to provide the service that people actually want, which is I want a vehicle in my driveway that takes me to where I want to go and then I don't want to deal with it. That's right. And, or, you know, I, I just want to show up when I need it, take me where I, I want or where I can drive it where I want. And then I can let go of it and, and be about my business. Um, that that's, I think really the, you know, as you ask kind of what's the, what's the long-term plan, that's, that's the end game is, uh, you know, the, the vehicle as a service, um, that is the right size for what we use it for. And so having, you know, I, 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 I look at it as like the 80% niche, you know, people are like, ah, oh, at Arkhamotos, it's super niche. Well, the niche that we're going after is 80% of the trips on the road. Yeah, see, I, I think that's just a fair argument because I would argue that the current system of buying ridiculously hot, hot, big, high gas use vehicles for 10 mile drives in traffic makes no sense at all. Like there's this thing, like I have to have this like big gas guzzler to feel cool or something like that. And, and then you're like in Santa Monica looking for parking. And I'm like, why would you think you're gonna find a parking space with this monstrous nightmare that you drive? You know, it's like, there is none. There's no beach parking. But if I had an Arkimoto, right? I'm just pulling right up. Man, that thing is 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 a perfect thing for Venice Beach. It's perfect. And you and know, you park you know, it anywhere. What we look forward to is the day when the vehicle we're building now is the big hulking vehicle on the road, right? So- Right, that's what I'm saying. It, it, we don't need these big vehicles, yep. you know? So oh, I got to haul junk back and forth for my kid. You know, that's- Come on. And, and, and at that point, if you, I mean, what, once with, and this really comes down to not just changes in vehicle technology, but also the ubiquity of, of apps on your phone. When, when, when the, you know, the, the friction of renting a large vehicle 10 years ago was, oh, I had to go down to Hertz. I had to, you know, fill out forms and triplicate. I've got, you know, all right. that kind of stuff. Today I can use, you know, Turo or get around. Turo is amazing any number of vehicle sharing apps to use the vehicle I need when I need it and not have to deal with it after that. Um, and, and I think that's gonna be a, a profound shift in how people think about cars and car ownership. Yeah, I agree. I agree hundred percent. Turo is part of that, I think, sea change of thought about just transportation in general and what, what we actually need and what we're using and why. And also with commuting going down the need for that big car goes down too, because I'm not really driving two hours to work back and forth. You know, I don't need to, um, but I might need to go down the street to the grocery three times, you know, a day. So, so you know, it, it, it changes the utility of vehicles and the way we perceive that utility. And I think that's, that's a super positive. Um, I, I really like everything we talked about, but just to, to get off topic for a second, you got a banjo back there. Uh, do you play that thing? <laughs> You got to watch our third quarter earnings call. I haven't seen it. I, I oh, yeah. really played on the call. You know, I'm a guitar player and I have been my whole life. Um, and that's why I have a music company because when I was a kid, I had two choices. You know, it was be a musician and be poor or trade stocks and, and be rich. And, and I chose to, to trade stocks and be rich. Um, and But I vowed that I would, you know, continue to play music either way in which I have. Um, and now I, I, thanks to Tesla, I funded a music company and, uh, and it's been an amazing thing. So I'm a big supporter of music and I find the banjo to be one of my favorite instruments that I don't play. Uh, it has such a unique sound and I'm a big Grateful Dead fan. So being from Oregon and being probably about my age, I was wondering if you're a deadhead. Well, so you very- play that banjo better than anybody. So, so I, uh- the banjo is actually, that was my dad's banjo. And it was, it had a broken neck and no strings for the last five years. Uh, well, actually pretty much my whole life. So in, uh, in the fall at, at our, at our Q2 call, uh, somebody on the call said, Hey, are those instruments just for show or do you actually play? Right. So Q3, we actually did a, did a little bluegrass song on the porch. Uh, nice. I gotta go back and look at that. But my my I'm I'm a, I'm a very beginner banjo player. Uh, it's hard. Played the guitar for uh, you know 25 years or something like that. Um, I, you know, funny. You know, the, the dead came here every summer when I was. That's growing right. Up. 
and I never went to one of the shows, but I did, I, I became a cheese head in like, oh, well. so that was when I was like, oh, this is why people follow bands around. And I think I saw like, those dead organ shows are actually considered classics. You know, a lot of those dead organ shows, I never went up for them. Um, but Oregon has this vibe up there. I've never spent time up there, but a, a super cool vibe. And uh, well, when uh, when we're when we're out of this little pandemic thing, we'll have to get you up here to uh, to check out the factory, and uh, we'll, we'll go rip around on some Arkhamotos. I'll meet you in Eugene anytime you want, Ross. I, I'm, you I'm know, there. I have elaborate plans when I'm free again. You know, like you know, I think everybody's going to have elaborate plans when we're free again, but. But I'm really looking forward to that because, I, it, you know, through the pandemic, I've met some great people and, and good companies and, and I miss seeing people in person a lot. I'm not that into Zoom in the sense of I prefer human interaction, but but I'm looking forward to those days where we can all hang out again and, and Zoom yeah, around yeah. our Komodos until the cops pull us over or whatever. I just, I just hope we can all be a, a lot more intentional about travel. You know, I mean, this is like getting, uh, you know, traveling to hang out with people because you actually want to hang out with them, uh, you know, rather than looking at it as, as sort of a, a requirement to have basic conversation. I know, I, you know, I think we, we've been saying this in my firm and, and we don't like saying it too much because like the human cost of the pandemic has been horrendous. You know, it's just like a horrendous human cost, but there are so many benefits we've gotten from it, from a, a bigger awareness of our time and space to um, understanding the importance of the environment. You know, like here in California, it's been amazing. Like during the pandemic, it was amazing what happened. The air being clean, the water was clean. You go to the beach, the dolphins were jumping out of the water. And I was just like, wow, you know, there's so many cars on the road polluting every day in my city, every day. Like just even driving was such a headache. I can get on the road right now and just drive wherever I want, you know? And it's just great. It's great. So I think we've all rethought many things about our lives. And as we re-put this together, it will not be what it was. Yeah. I think transportation, the way we perceive transportation, our time, and how we do it is going to change dramatically in the future. Dramatically. And I, and I think for a good thing, people waste their lives in traffic. Waste it. Yeah, I, I, would I would definitely agree, you know, that the pandemic has carried just a horrendous cost to so many people and so many families. It's a nightmare. Uh, but it's a nightmare. I, it really is. I, I, I'm i really disappointed we made no progress in the last 12 months with this shit. You know, it's, it sucks. If we can at least, if we can, if we can find some silver linings out of it, I think that would be to our long-term benefit. I think, I, I, that's what I'm saying. I think we will. I, I think as humans, we will. And it's kind of what you were saying, you know, the idea of, I used to fly to New York to do a TV show, you know, and it was like stay in a hotel and all the gas used and the pollution and then time and stress and exhaustion. And now I go, I do shows on Zoom like all over the world and, yeah. and it's, you know, huge TV shows or whatever. And it doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't yeah. matter. I haven't worn a suit. I wore a suit for 27 years, 27 years. In my wildest dream, I dreamed of this, you know, like I wouldn't have to do it anymore. And, and it happened, you know. Um, so I wear it once in a while, but but clients don't need it anymore. You know, yeah, it's a little weird to put on a suit and wear it into my living room. That just I, doesn't I know I do it for TV shows. I'm at home. I'm going to dress like I dress at home. I know. I know. You know, amazing how the perception of things shifted. Also, people's acceptance of this as a form of communication that it is is a good in theory as meeting kind of what you were saying the business trip idea where we were flying for meetings for a two hour meeting and like a whole thing you know now this is great well and, and i think there's this there's this sort of notion that you can't really get the in you know the, that really in person sort of vibe uh online but i i don't know i found it like i'm in my i'm in my living room there's a comfort zone for me i can be personable i can i mean i can I can have an authentic human connection. Right, it's more authentic. Yeah, with somebody who is also in their place of comfort at home versus, right. you know. The only thing we, we miss, and we think it's about a 10% of the relationship part, is the part like where we go get a drink now, you know? And that part is kind of the best part, you know? 
That's why you just gotta you gotta ship them the beers ahead of time. No, it's not the same. You know, I you know I like hugging Galley. I met them. <laughs> I, I, i'm definitely like getting fomo because i'm like man we would have an epic uh totally. session over some brews right now if totally. that was allowed like yeah. definitely when having we, some fomo when gally and i start going man we could talk all night like all night long i mean he's he's one of my favorite people to talk to because you know one of the secrets to my success is, is knowing people like gally who are super smart and young where i can get ideas and give ideas and 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 you know, we went through this whole thing with Tesla together um, from the beginning almost. And, and, uh, and, and it's just like been an, an incredible experience in so many ways, you know, that us too really had such an impact on now one of the most important companies in the world. Like it's kind of cool, you know, and, and that's why I want to be involved with what you're doing. We have bought stock in the company. So I am an investor now. Oh, um, right on. And well, uh, hey, welcome aboard. Yeah, no, listen, this is what we invest in. So there's two sides of investing. There's the making money side and there's the making a difference side. So my firm is known for both. And if we can make a difference, we prefer it. And if we're investing in companies that are, maybe aren't making a difference in a positive way, but they just sort of like a regular product, but they're doing things we don't like, we were activists, you know? And, and, you know, to the upside where I can really help Acromoto is, you know, I, I have tremendous visibility about the investments that we invest in and people care. We can bring a lot of, in, not only our investors, but outside investors and a lot of attention to your company over time, which could be hugely beneficial for all of us um, from raising capital to higher stock prices and whatever. Um, so really, you know, I'm not like a stock promoter, but I'm a big believer that, you know, if people like your company, you know, know about it, they're going to buy the stock. And, and that's the way it works. And, and that's what Gally and I bring to the table is we can bring knowledge to people about your company. And that's what gets people to invest. And, and your story is great. Your story is great. So, I, and I got to say, this was like one of the best uh, breakdowns. Like I felt like an, it was such a treat for honestly, the hyperchange viewers and listeners too to be able to tune in. Cause like just having you Ross ask Mark questions and me kind of be this fly on the wall. I was like, probably one of my favorite all time podcasts that's happened on hyperchange. I got to oh, say, that's, that's so good. I'm, I am super, I'm so excited that this happened and went down. Well, I, was like, kind of, I was kind of like, you're like, okay. Cause I go through these questions with CEOs, you know, not all the time, but you know, like I, I, you know, I, I know what I want to know, you know, and, and really I want to know who the person is, you know, and, and that's super important, but I don't usually do that on a podcast, you know, the first time um, my sort of discovery process, cause I've already gone through the books. I already know the financials like that. That isn't actually that important to me. And that's something that I think a lot of people investors mistake is they, they stare at the past financials too long. And they're not looking at the future vision. And that's why I like to get to know CEOs, you know, like all the CEOs I invest real money with, I know, you know, and, and why? Because we deal with a lot of money now. I manage, you know, 1.65 billion, you know, so, you know, if we could buy 5% of your company or 3% of your company, now it's getting expensive, thanks to Galley. And, you know... <laughs> I was like, Gally, you fucking making the stock go up. I'm trying to buy this thing, you know? I like I hopefully it goes down. <laughs> no offense, you know. Um, but uh no, I mean, you know, I don't I don't care because I'm I'm thinking two, three years from now, you know, like in two, three years from now, you execute your business plan, you got a great business, you know. Well, it's awesome. exciting. Well, I think that's a perfect place to wrap it up. Uh, I just wanted to thank y'all again for for joining Mark and Ross. Really appreciate the time and and both of y'all being open to this because I had a blast. And yeah, thank you. Yeah, well, thanks yep. for having us. You know, I, I hope this is good for your viewers too um, as well because um, I think your viewers want to learn about cool hyper change companies and this is definitely one of them. And they want to learn about how great investors learn about those companies, right? which is what this episode you know, this showed. Of Polaris, you know, the company Polaris um, that makes all these vehicles that are gas vehicles that has built a pretty big business doing that. They better be scared of you. That's for sure. Because they're out polluting the woods left and right. You know what I mean? Well, we're, we're, we're staying focused on the road for the moment. So. Yeah. No, that's right. They're off road. That's right. They're off road. 
But it's the same idea where it's these vehicles that are fun. Definitely. Fun and useful. That's where fun utility really comes in. Right. And that, that's the name, right? Fun utility vehicle. That's the one. Genius. Love it. F-U-V. Well, yeah. peace out, everybody. Thanks for yeah, tuning thanks, in. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Nice to meet you as well. Looking forward to learning more, too, and we can meet in person. I'll take soon. Woo! Thanks.